feeling to have you at IIM Bangalore. And uh, there are two things I must confess, and I'd lo love to do these sessions, which I always announce in the first class of every session, that I love teaching for a very different reason, because nobody listens to me at home. <laughs> and when I get an opportunity to come, I grab them. Today, I'm going to be a little duller than usual, because I have a very bad viral fever. Um, but I was very keen to meet you, and we will not let that bother us. I also wanted to engage with all of you today. Is it OK if I sit down? Yeah. OK. Then I'll be a little bit more energetic. So in the last Vista, a very strange thing happened. So our students invited me to give a talk on effective communication. And I was prepared. I'm always prepared to teach communication. But when I came in, I asked the participants last time that, hey, would you like me to talk about six lessons of career that I wish I knew when I was your age, or effective communication? And unanimously, they all said, sir, forget communication. Let's just talk about that six lessons. So I did that talk. And I didn't know that the talk went, uh, it went all over the place. So I started getting lots of messages from many of you. And when Yash and his team came, that, sir, Vista is happening again. I said, all right, I'll go and talk. And this time, I thought I'll collect all those questions and do a talk with all of you. The title of the talk is not fixed, but we'll build it together as we go along. And what I want to do is talk to you about something that I'm very bothered about these days. So I'll paint two scenarios. And the two scenarios are very common in the world, at least that I live in. I get emails from questions, which is something like, uh, I get emails from students, which is something like this. That, sir, I have been given admission to two colleges. Which one do I choose? Very classic question. I wish, I mean, when I was younger, I had also asked the same question. So I usually give my answer, which is very simple, that, hey, follow your heart. But then I know that deep inside, the student is really not asking this question. The question is a lot deeper. And I then start to discuss with them. And I teach here. I also studied here and uh, spent the best years of my life in this institute. So I'm very close to the uh, staff, faculty, students, and alumni. And I started to observe their lives. And uh, I started to notice that many of the students that I work with, not only in this college, but in few other colleges, are experiencing a tremendous amount of anxiety because of their career. Despite India having a ton of good institutes, despite our country having lots of opportunities, I feel that the student body is suffering from a tremendous amount of anxiety. And the anxiety comes from few issues, which I think all of us know. One is a classic uh, psychological behavior called the fear of losing out. That if I choose institute A versus B and I take A, what if B is better? And that puzzles me that why is it causing so much of stress and anxiety? And then I also work with a lot of executives, uh, because I teach an executive education program and um, discuss with them. Again, the same anxiety, that they are also very anxious about what will happen tomorrow. Will we have a job? And it puzzles me that you all worked very hard to come where you are. And now you're all very anxious. And, and to me, that is a bizarre question. That the whole purpose of education is to liberate you from fear, is to make you fearless. But what I see is it is making all of us tremendous anxious and, in many words, afraid of our future. Do you agree with this? And I want to talk about this, that this is getting extremely problematic for all of you and to me, because I can't see my country go down like this. And in this talk, I'm not going to talk about what's happening. 
I'll probably tell you a different perspective, which if you know, might help you do something about it. And it is a uh, observational based theory and talk that I start doing these days. Uh, I started my own school called the School of Meaningful Experiences nine months ago with the same intention that our teenagers are going through tremendous anxiety. Their problem is, do I do math or non-math? And then in non-math, there are some classifications. Then in science, there's a classification. And uh, I think if we are to understand these concepts better, I will give you two scenarios. Scenario one is a student who is studying in a very good college, is about to go to a job, very good job, uh, keeps moving in life. But again, anxiety is deafening in them because I talk to them, mentor them, coach them. But last month, or I think the month before that, I met a very interesting guy somewhere. This person, he's about maybe 22-ish, and we got introduced by a common friend. And I asked him, so where are you studying? And he's like, I'm not studying. He left his studies uh, at the age of 17 or 18, so he finished 12th, and after that he didn't go for a college. So I'm very curious that, okay, how are you paying your bills and what are you doing? And he's like, yeah, I last year did some coding exercises, I got some freelance project. The year before that I was building houses, I enjoyed doing that. The year before that I apprenticed with a company, there are a lot of people who give internship projects. The year before that I did nothing and just traveled all around the world. And I'm like, boss, you must be very rich. That's the first thing. He said, no, come from a very middle class, lower middle class background. So here are two scenarios, student A and student B. Student A has everything in life, great marks, uh, all the right bells and whistles, but extremely anxious. And student two, who has no educational qualification, does all kinds of things. But when I look at him, I find him so happy and so full of life. And it was such a joy to have a conversation with him. I had like an hour with him. And we talked about movies, books. We talked about travel. And he's a great listener as well. So he let me talk about my passions. Uh, but I was amazed that he knew so much that sometimes not many of us also know. And because he depends a lot on learning from alternate places, his journey of learning is very, very different. So if I were to dissect the minds of these two students, doesn't matter who they are, I'd like to give an answer of what's going on. And that answer is a little complex. It has three fundamental issues that we should be aware of and two solutions that I would offer you so that you could do something about your anxiety levels and your life. So when I start digging inside student A and student B, there's a fascinating concept that Sherlock Holmes said, which was there in this modern episode of Sherlock. Has anybody watched BBC Sherlock? So there's a concept called Mind Palace, right? which in the original book is called Brain Attic that what does your brain attic have? And there's a fascinating scene between Holmes and Watson. And Watson says that, Holmes, you have no idea what's happening in the world. You're only focused on your work. And how do you survive? And Holmes says that, you know, my dear Watson, I have no interest whether the sun goes around the moon or the moon goes around the sun because it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that, that crime that is in front of me and the solution for that crime, because that excites me. And I will learn whatever I have to learn, forensic sciences, chemistry. And if you look at Holmes, he had all the skills to test hypothesis. He was not educated, by the way. He was not a degree holder from Oxford or anything. He was just self learned but extremely good at his work. So when I start looking at the brain attic concept of student A and student B, there are three fundamental differences. The first difference is how does a student or anybody, even a corporate executive would believe in this, how does a student or a corporate executive depend on external validation? 
this word external validation is fascinating. Somebody has to tell us how good we are. So there's an exam, JEE, CAT, you name it, GMAT, GRE, and that score defines our validation that are we good or bad because after that we apply and then there's a pecking order in schools and jobs and the river flows and it gives us great results but the river flows for very few people for the rest it's a struggle and I'm from that struggling piece that it's not easy to survive this river and I'm a very mediocre student so I had to catch up and go through a hell because of this whole thing that external validation is the first reason that causes a tremendous amount of anxiety in us because we have forgotten the connection with ourselves. So, so to give you this perspective, I'll tell you a story about uh, my father. My father is probably my best teacher. And over time, I think I've become very close to him. Earlier, I used to fight with him a lot. But now I think he's become my best friend. So we go for long walks and discuss all kinds of things. And, and he's a great uh, teacher. So here's what happened. And he lives in Jodhpur, so I went there, I think, three summers ago. And I blogged about it as well. So there's a lovely garden behind our house. And when my father built his house at 62, he retired. And 62, he started building his first house. That's the only property he ever could afford. Um, the neighborhood was a very upcoming neighborhood because the city was very expensive. So he bought a house far away from the city and completely barren. So he and few others bought lands there and small pieces and built houses. And not only they built, ho built houses, they started developing roads and they started getting electric lights. And there was a small space where a garden was planned. And nobody would do anything about it because the politicians were too busy doing their own stuff. So nobody cares. So my father and his five, six friends, they started pooling resources and they built this garden from their own money. They started building a wall, they started planting trees, and in about two, three years, the results were amazing. That garden was the magnet of the whole society. Everybody would come there, and you could see the play area full of mothers and children, and everybody walking around, greeting each other, perfect society. Now, in this garden, there is a small place at the entrance where there is a marble plaque, a big one. And it recognizes the names of all those people who had contributed for this park. And my father's name was not there. So I was baffled. I thought maybe there's another plaque and he'll, his name would be there. So I, I, he was talking to somebody else and I was standing there. So he came. And I asked my dad, that, Dad, your name is not there. You were the one who started everything. So he looked at it and said, yeah, I mean, I mean the politics was too dirty. And then people started putting all kinds of things. And it, I, had a, you know, I, I didn't have a good, good experience. So I did not even want them to put my name. So I said, Dad, you did everything. At least there should be some recognition. All your effort is gone. He's like, no, the effort is still there. It's all around us. Now my name is not on this wall, which is fine. But let me tell you that people in this city spit on walls. And I don't want my name to be there. And this is where my father, met the, so he doesn't stop there, you know, lesson after lesson. So this is like, you know, imagine a bombshell dropping on me, da, 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 and I'm reeling from the message. Because I'm very keen to get recognition, my name should be on the website. I mean, I'm a human being. And by nature, I want appreciation. Here's a man who's like, I don't want it, I don't care for it. So I said, okay, dad, I understand that maybe at your age, you don't need it. He said, no, that's not the point, Rakesh. The point is, I think for me, it is enough that my family knows what I've done. It's enough that the whole neighborhood knows what I've done. Now, if a wall doesn't recognize my name, I'm okay with that. Because I give zero importance to that entire process. And this is called external validation. That are we going to a college because of the awesome name it sounds? Or are we going to a college because we genuinely want to learn something? And I find that students who are highly dependent on external validation experience a tremendous amount of anxiety. And the external validation does not stop at colleges. It goes to a company's name. Many students want to work 
with a branded company. I like these words brands because we teach those things here. And brands are trustworthy names. When I look at students not going to startups and going to a big company, like 30,000 people working in a company, but being a part of that company, I feel that something is going wrong in education because your decision-making systems are based on the name of that company. So here's what happens to this student. He goes to this big company. He's forgotten. Nobody knows him. There are 30,000 people. Now all you have is a LinkedIn name that, okay, you went to this company X. That's all. But the market doesn't care. You may think that I'll get a tremendous amount of validation, but the reality is that there are many people who have not worked with great companies and are still doing all right. So the first message I want to give you is that start looking at how you are deciding your careers because if you are going to be dependent on external validations, then I think it will always be a rat race that you can never come out of. And I've experienced that for about 12 years. My first job was Wipro. Then in Wipro, this was in 1997. If you didn't go to America, you, know, you, you were nobody. External validation, American. You had to have the Levi's jeans, sky blue color, and white Nike shoes, like so white <coughs> that fair and lovely would get shy away. So I think the, the whole idea was that I also aspired, but very soon realized that it was not that great experience after a point. And then from Wipro, I went to Intel, again a great company. From Intel, I went to Qualcomm, again a great company. But very soon I realized that after a point, it's very, very uh, stressful <coughs> because the external validation world doesn't stop. And then when I quit the corporate world, I started to realize that there is a world where you don't need external validation. And how does that come? We'll talk about it in the next few minutes. So the first thing is student A versus student B, their minds are less dependent or more dependent on what? External validation. So that's the first concept. The second concept is something like this. By nature, our entire system, education, the way we live, everything is built on comparing with each other. And this is where things become very interesting. If you're on the positive side of comparison, you get a lot of rewards, you never have a problem. But again, those kind of people are very few. Average and lower average always have a tough time. If you're shorter in the class, there's a problem. If your name is like V, you know, you have a problem. Then the apartment you live, whether you have a two bedroom, three bedroom, villa. And I'll, I have friends who live in some apartments, very funny names they have. They have within the apartment, like a very expensive apartment, multiple comparison circles. The first circle is called Villa Club. That means if you're not having a villa, you're a loser in that apartment, right? So all the apartment owners are in one category and the villa owners are in the second category. That's not enough. There's one more category, the expat community. People who are in apartments or in villas but are from or they have US parts, passports or something like that. And I find these things baffling and people take tremendous pride. So I met one guy from that, that hey, I'm so and so and I live in Villa 300. I'm like, good for you. <laughs> How does it matter? <laughs> and I think this is what is causing a lot of problems in all of us, that we also aspire to become like that. It's a pretty good thing to have. You get tremendous amount of recognition by the comparison articles that you have and the world recognizes you, which is where the person who has the highest marks gets the highest job, and that's wrong. And this comparison is creating a tremendous amount of anxiety and stress in all of us. Now, let me explain to you how this whole thing works. Um, when you are in a system, let's say a student system or a corporate system or any system, you will always find that somebody is better than you. I think that part is inevitable. So if you're good in math, somebody will be good in presentations. If you're good in presentations, somebody will be good in XYZ or website building or something else. So if you start comparing and living your life according to that, I think everything will, will fall flat. And I'll explain this using how our Indian parents tell our young students because I went through that same stuff. I still remember when I was in class 11th, struggling to find my engineering college one uncle came to me and said that, beta, ek bar engineering kar lega na? Ek bar. 
लाइफ इज ब्यूटिफुल आफ्टर दैट सो आई रियली थॉट मस्ट बी राइट यार अंकल बोल रहा है सो आई रियली वर्क हार्ड और इंजीनियरिंग कर लिया एंड आई एंटर इंजीनियरिंग एम लाइफ इज नॉट ग्रेट एट ऑल बिकॉज देयर द रूल्स ऑफ द गेम आर वेरी डिफरेंट देन कम्स वन सीनियर इन थर्ड ईयर दैट राकेश एक बार जॉब मिल जाएगा ना लाइफ मजा आफ्टर दैट सो आई सर ओके सो आई वर्क वेरी हार्ड इन गॉट अ जॉब अगेन द सेम प्रॉब्लम then somebody said ek bar america jayega then somebody said ek bar tu ghar khareed lega somebody said ek bar tu senior manager ban jayega and vice president ban jayega it doesn't stop and after some time you get very tired with this whole system that i still remember this conversation i was having with two people this is a again a something i picked up in a school or a college there are two students talking kare today we have invited a speaker called let's say xyz he is a ted speaker the other student quickly said nahi nahi tedx speaker hai wo <laughs> which means not that great now here is here is me an academician who's like my god whether it is ted with an x or ted tum dono to nahi ho na at least is better than both of you but the world compares you and puts you on a pedestal which is where institutes have a ranking order and it is spoiling the minds of students that institute a if you get there life is beautiful and it doesn't happen like that in fact there is this movie called three idiots which was shot here and this is the place where chatur uh, ramlingan gave that speech remember chatur coming to uh, the first scene and he calls them on the water tank and there's a water tank here and he says that ye dekh mera lamborghini and this is a heated swimming pool and i will tell my secretary to give you 5000 dollars very condescending sentences but these are the sentences that are commonly used in the world that i am so good i have so much and my comparison with you is so good that the students start to think that i also would have it i mean why wouldn't a student want this kind of a life we desire a good life but what we miss out is that if your entire decision system is built on comparison with others then this race will never stop you you end up like chatur which is okay i have a lamborghini and a heated swimming pool now what and this student the other student which i talked to you about who is very carefree and lives a great life or at least i think he lives a great life doesn't compare himself to anyone he is very cool about it he doesn't have an educational degree he doesn't have a visiting card he is liberated and he is able to earn enough money to survive in fact he he talked to me about his savings and his savings are reasonably good as compared to what an average person of india would have which means he's figured out the way the world works so the second thing i'd like you to think about is that the more you depend on comparison to feel good the higher the anxiety you will experience in life all right and the last thing is before i go on to this particular um, third concept there's a again a one of my favorite stories is from doordarshan and uh, doordarshan uh, 1980s would air some of the best television serials full of life and very well scripted because in those days there were no channels so the top most of the top directors the top most of the top actors and the script writers would create an amazing experience so there was an episode <coughs> there was a serial called dr babu a story of a very simple doctor in bombay and he loved his work he was so full of passion with his work that i have to heal people i have to help them that he would not remember to take money from his patients he would just be so happy with them so every episode and in those days there were 13 episodes every episode is a story of the doctor waking up in the morning his wife saying ki bhai sahab you know bhai sahab aaj hi sunte ho please get some money because we have to pay bills and look at that doctor you know he has a big car look at this friend of yours he's built his own company what are you doing we are struggling and every he would leave the house with this dialogue kare bhagwan chinta mat karo paisa aa jayega and he would go reach his clinic and in the clinic some strange incident would happen somebody would land up and he would talk to them heal them some people would take him for a ride but then he would make sure that they are all hale and hearty and they would go away somebody would say ki doctor sahab main kal paisa dunga and kal never came so he would come home wife would say paisa laaye and he's like nahi nahi kal aa jayega and she would ki yaar you know the entire world is you know a simple world and you are so complicated 
and all I ask you to do is, you know, do something for your family that please, you're a doctor, do something so that we earn enough money. So he would again end the episode by saying, Ki Bhagwan, sab theek ho Now, 12 episodes pass like this, 13th episode, he gets a heart attack. And like every ham oriented script of India, guess the scene. He is collapsed, he is rushed to the doctor in the hospital. What would the doctor say to the wife? Nay, nay, one, that is also great, very good. You are you're two steps ahead. I like the melodrama. Huh? Pele paise bharo and jaldi se operation karna I mean, logically not very right. And, uh, but that's the scene. So the doctor says, Babiji, I know you all, that is fine. But first you have to pay 2 lakh rupees. And we have to immediately operate him or else, raat tak gaya ye. So melodrama and you know, so the Bhabi ji is like, where will I get money from? This man never earned anything. We were just surviving on goodwill and whatever savings we had. So doctor said, madam, I can't help you. So she runs, goes and sells off her Mangal Sutra, sells off the car, <coughs> asks people for help and comes back with some 15, 20,000 rupees by three o'clock or four o'clock and totally crying because it must have been a traumatic day for her. And she falls at the doctor's feet. Typical melodrama ki, doctor sahab, itna hi mere paas hai, please operate him. You know, I'll get something done, I'll sell the house. And the doctor said, madam, what are you doing? The operation is done, he's sitting absolutely fine, go in that room. So she's bewildered. So she goes inside the room and Dr. Babu is happily sitting there, smiling. Kare Bhagwan kahan thi tum? And now she breaks down and cries and typical, you know, she hits him and agar tumhe kuch ho jata to, you know, that level of ham acting, <laughs> terrible stuff. Anyway, so, and uh, so the Dr. Babu is enjoying and all the attention and the wife then gets the sense and asks him, Ki boss, what happened? How did this episode happen and how did they operate you when the money is not there? And Parikshit Sani, the guy, the guy who was in Three Idiots, uh, Farhan's father, uh, he was the Dr. Babu in that. And uh, he says, Bhagwan, turn around. So she turns around and in that room, all the 12 people who were there, they were standing. And one of them comes forward and says, Bhabi ji, don't worry, we are there for you. Paise ki koi kami nahi hogi. And the entire series ends with the doctor saying, Ki Bhagwan, I told you. Nothing will happen. And that's something which I think hit me very hard, that this doctor did not compare himself with anyone. He just kept doing his job. And then, you know, the world has this beautiful karma theory that does work. I can tell you that it absolutely works like a charm. That if you do good to others, only good things will happen to you. You have to deal with this whole comparison stuff. So that's the second message. Now let's look at the last message and then I'll sum it up into two suggestions and then we'll have Q&A. The third one, is a fascinating story that all of you would have heard uh, comes from Paulo Coelho's blog, very famous story. A story about a Brazilian fisherman and a businessman. So there's a beach, there's a fisherman sitting enjoying the beach and a businessman also sitting and enjoying the beach and the businessman starts to talk with the fisherman. Ki, hey man, what's your name? This guy tells his name, what do you do? So the fisherman says that I'm a fisherman. And uh, so the businessman says, all right, so how much fish do you catch every day? He's like, I catch four fish, it's enough for me and my family. Two we consume and two I sell in the market and I get enough money to buy oil, butter, bread. And uh, the businessman, that's all. Then what do you do after that? He's like, no, I go home, uh, talk to my wife, we have a lunch, then we all rest, siesta. Evening, we get up, have coffee again, then we go to a friend's house, we have a party, and night we sleep. And the next day, the same thing again. And the business is, man, what are you doing with your life? You should catch more fish. So the, the, the fisherman is like, all right, okay, uh, what will happen if I catch more fish? So the businessman says, then you'll have more fish, and you'll sell it, you'll get cash flow, that you can invest in a new boat, hire another person, so now you have multiple sources of income. And the fisherman is like, really? I didn't know all that. And then what will happen? And then the businessman is like, then you can hire some more agencies, create a business empire. If you have hundreds of boats and if you can do a cash flow, I'll invest in you. We'll do IPO. You'll become a billionaire. And the fisherman is like, really? Then what will happen? 
and then this guy is like then you can sit on a beach and enjoy your life forever and the fish is like that's what i'm doing right now <laughs> so this story we love it but i think is actually a very deep story that a lot of research has been done uh, including by one of the if you look at ted talks these days they are they are defined as mindfulness meaningful life and all that stuff but one of my favorites is by clayton christensen because when i was studying here there was a book i read about clayton christensen called own the innovators dilemma and i was uh, surprised that someone who wrote a book on strategy innovators dilemma can write a book called how do you measure your life i was surprised so there's a ted talk and in that ted talk he kind of hints the reason for what happened in his life i have a feeling that he also was a star professor tenure billions of dollars of funding very popular but one day would have figured out that what am i doing this for i'm alone my family is not with me i'm not going to become the dean of harvard business school so what am i doing all this for and then he started talking to his students about ki hey do you know how you measure your life and everybody said yes sir we know and this is a question we all ask our students to and the answers are i want to have good money i want to have a good family i want to start my own and then nowadays just like miss congeniality uh, have you seen miss congeniality you must uh, great movie but the mantra is that if you want to become miss universe whatever you say you have to end with world peace so our mba students have to say that after earning all enough money i'll become an entrepreneur and i'll give back to the society i'll open up a school that's the favorite answer these days so and and i feel that it's not going to happen simply because the way we are deciding and measuring our success is built on uh, x y z axis so imagine a 3d model the x axis is decisions based on money and we all use that yardstick as the first yardstick to decide our life everything is based on a number which is financial and it should be because financial uh, uh, freedom is a very important part of our life so we choose the first discussion is financial freedoms the second discussion is so what will society say so once we have got the finances right then we have to build a kind of a space for ourselves in this world which is which villa you live in are you respected which club do you have a membership so societal norms that's the second parameter of decision the third parameter which is the parameter that is often ignored is what do you want to do in your own life and i have i have discussed this with almost all my friends that hey what do you want to do with your life and invariably the answer is definitely not what i'm doing right now somebody says i want to do x y z and i ask them why didn't you and the answer is ki nahi yaar paisa loan you know life catches up and it's a it's a very interesting mystery so all of us we take decisions based on financials first society next and personal last but clayton christensen in his ted talk and there is lot of research on this says that can you measure your life in a very different way which is not dependent on only the money aspect in fact bhutan has started to measure life on gross happiness gross national happiness value gnhv and many countries are following suit that at the end of the day people should come back home and have a good life but if you are going to come back home late in the night and go on a telephone conference struggle the next day and live in anxiety i think the happiness quotient is very very low so the final thing that the student a and student b are able to think through differently is that student 2 has a different measure of life student 1 his entire discussion is based on a loan emi savings and it works backwards and that's why you will experience tremendous amount of stress in your life so now let me summarize these three concepts that student a versus student b the more you are dependent on external validation the more anxiety you will experience the more you compare with others the more anxiety you will experience and the more you have only a singular focus of measure of success which is money first society next and personal life last i think you'll have a tremendous amount of anxiety but if you look at the student too he has all the three in a very different things in his mind palace and that's why he is a lot more liberated and is able to do many more things there are two books i suggest you read both of them are fighting with each other and i happy these two books are there in the market 
The first one is called GRIT, G-R-I-T, by Angela Duckworth. She argues, and she is this typical topper of the class, went to the Ivy League classes or schools, went to the best company in the world, and then has now become a consultant researcher. And she wrote a book on grit, that be gritty, be resilient, have a singular focus on your expertise and keep hammering it, nuance it a little bit, but that's the focus that she talks about. Now, in many ways, it's a, it's a good book and it does give a tremendous amount of insight in how we live our lives. There's also a TED talk that she has talked about, you can watch that. The second book which came out just about five, four, five months ago is written by a person called David Epstein. He's a sports writer. And he says that, no, don't do that. In fact, you should have a huge range of careers. Grit, singular. Range, do 40 things. And he finds out, and there's a tremendous amount of uh, research on range. So the book, second book is called Range. And David Epstein and his TED Talks, I think his YouTube Talks are also phenomenal. And uh, he says that sports people are able to do this. If you look at Dhoni these days, what is Dhoni doing these days? Very different than sports. And before that, he was in the railways. Now, one can argue that, okay, if I was Dhoni, I also would have done it, right? But then if you look at their way of thinking, I think they are the range people. They go through so much of trials in life that it, it becomes a resilience of its own kind. So here are two suggestions I have, and then I'll open up to Q&A. Here is a summary of my suggestion to you. The first one <clears throat> is that student A versus student B boils down to two things. The first one is called resilience, which I talked to you about. That build your resilience. There's no course in this world who will teach you. Learn how to fail. Be gritty about what you're doing. Please stop worrying about what others are saying to you. And please do not compare with others. All of that is resilience. In fact, there's a phenomenal comical movie actually called Eddie the Eagle. And I encourage you all to watch that. Eddie the Eagle is about this guy who wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to become a ski Olympic jumper. And he has no skills about it. And his parents think he's crazy. But his mother always felt, ki, Yaar, you know, let me encourage him and all that stuff. So he goes to this Olympics and uh, looks at three jumping sleds. And he's like, okay, let me try my hand at the first one. So without any practice or any skill, he jumps from the first one and breaks every bone in his body. But doesn't stop. Comes back again after a few months, tries all over again. And it's a phenomenal movie. It's actually hilarious. And it's a true story. There is a person who broke the record. And there's nobody from UK who participated and came third or second or something like that. And he did that. And it's a, such a feel-good movie. But when you look at this character, at Eddie the Eagle, very simpleton, you won't even notice that he's a very famous person and doesn't care. He's like happy in his own world. Now, what is the psychological reasoning for this? The second thing is very important, that what do these people have that we could learn from? And the answer is surprisingly simple. They have extremely high levels of self-confidence and self-esteem. Something that we are going down dramatically. If the self-esteem level of a great student of our country is very low, then something has gone wrong. And it happens because of this constant comparison, external validation, and singular focus towards results, which is a number. And if you don't change that, your self-esteem and self-confidence will always keep going down and down and down. And I don't think any of you would be able to perform your dreams, passions that all of you so want to do. And we have one life to live. I think I encourage you all to consider this very, very seriously that I think all of you have an amazing opportunity. The world today is by far the most advantageous for your generation. There's plenty of resources. There's plenty of opportunities. The world has its own problems. I get it. But I think for someone like you, I think you can do anything you want. And I'll end this with five numbers that I'll throw at you, and I hope you guess that. So here are five numbers, and I'll quiz you what they mean. The first number is 10 billion. What does it mean? 10 billion. 
population by very good so you live in a world which will get more and more crowded so that's the first number second number 100 very good who said that life expectancy the child being born today chances are one in three children will go beyond 100 years they will live to the 22nd century chances are you will touch the dawn of the 21st century 22nd century actually it's a bizarre statistic and the third one is equally important for you to know 70 sorry no retirement is a good answer but think more second innings okay second innings might be a good answer but actually more than that that's the fourth one so i'll come to you on that 70 is the number of working years you can go on till from the day of graduation and all of you are worried about five six years you'll actually work for 65 to 70 years now i hope you retire which is a very classic answer because sir will retire at 45 if you do please adopt me i'm available <laughs> but i know for a fact you want because i'm at 40 and none of my friends are retiring in fact we are going strong warren buffet is not stopping bill gates is not stopping the richest men on earth you need something to do you can't sit at home okay you can enjoy a movie at home you can come back at four o'clock they can do that but you still need to do something so you are you have 70 working years give or take uh, in front of you fourth number five which is what you said five five careers is it jobs or careers chances are you will shift your careers five times or more you can start with mba or engineering become author become actor become lawyer become cricketer become actor become dhinchak puja for all you want <laughs> and anything is possible youtuber whatever and i think that is a reality because my generation is doing two at least your generation will touch three minimum and typically it is a job and entrepreneurship and usually a passion based job but i think that is changing very fast the generation today is going exactly the opposite and the last one three <laughs> are you married are you married first of all yes or no that's why you said this why would I want three? No, three marriages, but that has been happening quite often and there is no statistic. There is definitely research that says that the overall dilution of families is a lot more today than 50 years ago, but no, for heaven's sake, no, no, no three. I like the way he thinks. Uh, no, who said that? Most important. No, it can be three and more that changes. And with Facebook, it could be 5,000. <laughs> Most important followers of your life will never come to you when you need them. Three, come on, think. Jeff Bezos made an announcement today. Child, no, ch children are anyway more these days. Three degrees of? No, you can have more. In fact, Coursera and my course is on MOOC. So you'll do multiple degrees now. Four and five is common. Three, sorry? Three days, keep, I mean, marriage, three days, hopeful. I like the optimism you have in life. I'll give you the answer. There will be three places where human beings will live. The first is Earth. Second is Mars. And third is? Your generation. I have a feeling that one in ten might get a chance. Might. Your children, just like we have passports, they'll be like, oh, we went to moon. Which part of moon, north or south? Because the comparison comes in. <laughs> Mars, four villa or three villa? <laughs> the world will get there. We'll screw up the Mars people also. So if this is the future, my friends, why are you wasting your life on anxiety for choices which are so simple? And the answer is develop your self-confidence and self-esteem. Develop your resilience. Please stop comparing yourself. Please stop depending on external validation. And the last is, please find more ways of measuring your success. All right? So this was all I had to babble. Thank you very much. Any questions before I let you all go?
How much time do I have? Three minutes? I can have time? Okay, five, ten minutes. Okay, there's a hand there. Go ahead. I think there's a, so one is contentment doesn't mean not do anything. So there are, there's a nuanced way of thinking. You are contented with your job also. And innovation comes a little bit more when you are contented and you have that passion in you. And there's a book you may want to read called Flow. So if you have high skills and you love what you're doing and you are feeling challenged, you'll keep doing that and you'll be very contented. That doesn't mean innovation stops. In fact, innovation is more in that area. It's exactly the reverse of other way around, that if you hate your job, and if you are not skilled, you cannot innovate. So the question you asked is exactly on its head, that we need to be content to be progressive. Now, one is contentment as in contentment of the job. The second is you are dissatisfied because of a problem. And that dissatisfaction causes progress. So these are two different issues. Does this make sense? You should always be discontent or on the problem that why is it that I'm not getting a taxi? Let me solve that problem. But that doesn't mean that, okay, I'm contented, so I'm going to not go anywhere. I'm Bangalore, so I'm going Our security won't allow it, by the way. Right? These are very two, two very different issues. Great question, but yes. No comments. <laughs> I, I can't, so uh, let, me, let me step back. It is changing very fast. I don't have an answer that yes, we have cracked it. Education is a very complicated ball of wax. Yeah, but there's a very gradual and visible shift. I now know of at least 15 companies who are saying, we don't care about your marks. Give us a candidate who can come and present a project we'll consider. So that is happening. Startup world has already reached there. The second is there are many uh, B schools with faculty who don't give a exact number. They give a relative number or a relative grading, which the student sometimes doesn't even tell the placement officers. So that day has also come. But I agree that bulk of it, bulk of it, and I, I mean, I'm one of those uh, people here who always say that we should just let go but I'll tell you a problem that I've seen in students. If you let go of certain uh, clamps, then the students also misuse it. I find that a more busy. I'll give you an example. I said in my course that no attendance. They stopped coming. <laughs> I was thinking that it's a sign of progressiveness. They stopped coming. And uh, then the professor who's very harsh on attendance, sablok log jate the wahan pe. And I'm like, yeah, I am a little cooler fellow. My classes are not that bad. And the, I think this is where I encourage your generation that the reason your generation is always looked down is that you also don't show your potential if given a chance. You end up in a very mediocre stage at some point of time. So this is where educational institutes and administration have a very simple lock. Yeah, let's not play with this. Jo chal raha hai, usko chalao. Machine is producing results, don't touch it. And there's this famous quotation that if it ain't broke, don't change. So there's no real problem. The world is earning money, students are getting lots of jobs, everybody's happy. We still get people who write that this institute changed my life. But if you look at the macro view, that this student is very scared and anxious, I think that's where we have failed. And it's not just a B school, it is deeper in education as we go along. And I work a lot with teenagers. Half of my work with teenagers is just to discuss with them, it is okay not to know math. If you're good in English, that's good for me. And I talk about these things in my class. So it'll take a, a, a little time, but I'm very hopeful that the, the innovations in education that I see today, another one generation, it'll change drastically. Your children would definitely have a very different view of education than you and I. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Anybody, please go ahead. Yeah. And then the range book like this, 
Yeah. So that's what these concepts are becoming. That if you look at the trajectory of life, a very big problem is that we are not encouraging failure. We are treating failure as a very wrong aspect. And Range talks about it. In fact, on Netflix, there is a series which I encourage all of you to watch called Losers, L-O-S-E-R-S. It's a story about how sports people fail, like miserably fail, but still bounce back. And look at us. I mean, one day I get a C minus in my course. I'm like, oh God, end of life. You know, let me just drink myself to death. So our, our tolerance to failure is very bad. And this is something a uh, very nice uh, podcast was there on Freakonomics. I think it was this lady who wrote this book called Eat, Pray, Love. Um, what's the name of that lady? Elizabeth Gilbert, I think. So there's a movie called Eat, Pray, Love. And uh, she wrote that book. And she does amazing talks. And she says that we treat failure as a bad thing in our home. So we have a child called happiness. We pamper happiness and success. Failure, ja ke bad pe. And she says, don't do it. Failure has to sit on the same table because that's a very important fuel for learning. And our education system and our corporates are not encouraging that. That's a flaw. I, I think I'm, I'm part of it. Last year, I flunked my PhD. I was devastated. And it had a huge impact on my life. But I think that episode also made me a lot more different than what I am today. And that's what failures are. So it's not about choosing because of failure. It's about treating failure as an important milestone for the next stage, which is what Range talks about. All right? uh, there were two questions here, and then I'll take last one, and then we'll go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's not possible. You cannot have that mindset forever. Every day, by the way, there is not a single person who doesn't feel low every day. I'm yet to find one. It's human nature. There's not a single person who doesn't think that, what am I doing? And that's the way progress happens. So don't become this machine which always will do the right things. That's exactly what I was talking about, that it will fatigue you. Instead, become more resilient that, OK, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And today, we'll try something new. We'll fail. And when you fail, our self-esteem goes very low, right? So what happens is there's a wonderful TED talk by Daniel Kahneman where he explains the peak end rule that failure leaves a tremendous distaste in our life. And many of us would have experienced failure very recently. Would you call it a very joyful feeling or a very disgusting feeling? And that disgusting feeling stops us from trying something new. And that's what you need to start doing, that this world, 21st century, will give you more. So you have to now build your self-esteem so that these things don't bother you. And you become a lot more resilient. Okay? Yeah. One and one last. And I mean, I have four people. They're like, I mean, they're giving me the looks, sir, enough. Yeah. Sir, what do you think? Uh, that we should learn to face that anxiety period or we should get resistance. We should resist that period. No, I think talk about your anxiety. A very big part that you should all invest is just like you have, you have your physical hygiene, Please invest in mental hygiene. Anxiety is a mental problem. I mean, our may brain is going through a lot of stress. And that stress is caused by failures and comparisons and jealousy and anger, heartbreaks, rejections. I mean, we are at an age where love is very important here. Yeah? And then we go to this girl and she's like, no. And you feel, oh, God. <laughs> and then you sit in a business school, ki, ab main entrepreneur banunga. Are, abhi to heartbreak hua hai, kya entrepreneur banega tu? Right? So if you don't connect these two things, your self-esteem is going to be... See, this is where everybody laughed. There's only one thing you'll remember today about my lecture, and that is this. <laughs> so please do mental hygiene. Please clean up your brains. Please talk about it. And this is the time when you need a good friend, a good soulmate, a journal, if not a counselor. And I'm a counselor on Mondays, and I get to meet lots of people. We don't judge them. We try and help them in their journey. But the problem is, again, you'll compare yourself. Oh, I'm mentally weak. I'm so bad. 
So this is a sign you need to start working on. And the only way is self-confidence, self-esteem. The moment you raise that up, here's a simple formula for you. Draw three circles, and one of my colleagues taught me this. Draw three circles, concentric circles, all right? The innermost circle, write down things you're really good at. All right, really, really good. That you can write good emails, you can drive a bike really well, you can sleep very well, you can eat an amazing amount of biryanis. Figure that out. But that's your core circle. Then the next circle, all those skills, your average. I can do a good presentation, I can do a balance sheet, whatever. And the last is all those skills you are really bad at as compared to others, like bungee jumping, acting, and you know, like a South Indian mov movie actor who comes on the screen and he's handsome, good looking, fights 20 people, takes care of the girl, that kind of category. And your skills are none of them. <laughs> By the way, I have one more problem. I just, I think I have dengue and uh, even a machar has put me down, yaar. I mean, my life, imagine my self-esteem right now. You come to campus, people beat you up, now a machar also beat me up. So I'm really low right now. But the point is, when you do these three concentric circles, the answer is very obvious. The answer is, pick a life on the center circle. All of us are picking a life on the outside circle. That's what is causing us a lot of anxiety. So you have a choice. Make that choice as early as possible. Last question. Okay, any of you, I mean... Yeah. So change your surroundings. That's why you need to have multiple interests. Yeah. You know, there is a word I want you to Google. That word is called toxic relationships. Sometimes we have toxic relationships. Our parents can be very toxic. And I deal with many teenagers who come and tell me that, Uncle, please tell my parents to shut up. Now, when this same teenager wants a cell phone, the parents are the best friends and he'll do everything. But at some point in time, it's a toxic relationship. So please change your friends and surroundings. And this is where you should take an amazing jump and leap of faith in life. That find a city and go find a simple apprenticeship or a job which can give you that six months of new thinking. You need to change. And if you don't, this is like a pot which just keeps becoming bad and bad. So please do that toxic relationship or friends. Sometimes our friends are very bad, you know. They find tremendous pleasure in making us feel very bad. And you know who they are in your group. And you want to be with them because it makes you feel good. And this is a sign of low what? Because you are depending on them to make you feel good. So please start working on this. And I'm very concerned about you because you are the future of my country. And if we have to really make our country into this world-class place, I ca we can't afford to have these problems coming in our way. All right? So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. And I will let you all go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for such an insightful session. And a big round of applause, Professor, because he agreed to come and address us in spite of having viral fever. Thank you, sir. I'd like to call upon stage Mr. Yash Parekh uh, to give a small token of appreciation to Professor for being such a great, insightful session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All the best.